Okay, this is uh, the first of a two-part module on polymer characterization. So we've already kind of introduced polymers and some really basic definitions and talked a little bit about what they are. Um, and at the, we kind of concluded with uh, a discussion of the main ways in which polymers are characterized. And we said that those were chemistry, size, shape, and structure. Uh, and we're going to go through each of those four um, characterizations here in this in this lecture uh, and, and talk about what each one means. So let's first move to chemistry. And we define the, po uh, the polymer chemistry just by the repeat units that exist in the composition of the polymer. So in the case of hydrocarbons, um, that's just made up of carbon and hydrogen. And those make up um, uh, uh, a large majority of the polymer systems that we are uh, familiar with today. Uh, classic example that we've already seen is polyethylene. Uh, obviously, it's a, a couple uh, a couple carbon atoms um, bonded to uh, these hydrogen atoms in in a chain structure. Another example would be PVC, polyvinyl chloride. Looks the same in terms of its repeat unit as polyethylene, except one of the hydrogens is replaced with a chlorine atom. And we can create a lot of different polymers by just swapping out uh, sort of one of these atoms, uh, one of the hydrogen atoms for some other atom or some other um, uh, organic um, molecule. And so there actually is a generalized form for these hydrocarbons. And that is where we replace one of the hydrogens with this, uh, we'll call it this R, this this uh, side group that usually is some other atom or organic group. So that's one class of uh, uh, polymer uh, polymers that you need to be familiar with. Another class that's fairly common are called fluorocarbons. <clears throat> and that's just made up of carbon and fluorine atoms. So uh, same thing as uh, polyethylene, except instead of hydrogens being bonded, now we have fluorines being bonded up here. And this in particular is uh, something you know of as Teflon. So just, again, trying to, to locate these chemistries in your, uh, your, just your basic understanding. A few definitions that you need to be aware of with respect to these uh, polymer chemistries is the first is functionality. And all that is is the number of bonds that a monomer uh, can form. So if I look at a monomer, let's let's just take this Teflon monomer. I have a uh, I might be able to bond at this end, and I might be able to bond at this end. So we would have a functionality of two, um, depending on how complex the the a monomer is, we can have higher functionalities, and those will be important for forming some of the more complex structures that we know exist in things like epoxy. Um, but fun so just remember, functionalities, uh, functionality of a monomer is how many places it can form a, a new bond. If if the polymer that we form has a, is formed by a single type of repeat units, which is the case for all the ones we, that we've looked at here, that's called a homopolymer. And if we use more than one repeat unit, then it's called a copolymer. So those are some basic definitions. It's just a real brief overview of uh, polymer chemistry with respect to its composition. Okay, now we want to talk about polymer size. And so the, the po polymer size is, is measured by the molecular weight of a molecule. Uh, and it's just a measure, uh, basically, of the sum of the molecular weights of each repeat unit in the molecule. So if I have a very short molecule, then I don't have very many repeat units, so I'm going to have a low molecular weight. If I have a very long polymer chain, then I'm going to have a lot of repeat units. Those will sum up to give me a high molecular weight. The important thing to remember here, aside from just what what molecular weight for a polymer molecule means, is that for any polymer system, the molecular weights are not identical for each molecule in the system. So you can't look and say, oh, there's 50 um, repeat units in the system. That's what every molecule has. That's not how it works. It's actually going to be represented by a distribution. And so this phenomena that, that the molecular weights aren't identical for, for each molecule in the system is something we refer to as polydispersity. And it's, we represent the molecular weight in the system by a distribution. So in this case, we're grouping, you know, we're creating bins of a molecular weight from this is uh, 5 to 10,000, molecular weights from 10 to 15,000, etc. And then this is the number fraction, how many molecules with those weight ranges exist, and you can see the binning. And so 
uh, on the one hand, we can show a number fraction. On the other hand, we can show a weight fraction, which is uh, what, uh, which which is basically how much of a uh, component of weight does that particular bin uh, lend to the the uh, polymer molecule. So those are going to be important as we as we formally define uh, the molecular weight of a polymer system. Uh, we can define it actually in three different ways. Uh, one would be the number average molecular weight, which we just talked about, and that's just the the um, given by m bar uh, with the subscript n, and it's the sum of uh, this xi term, which is the number fraction uh, of the chains of whatever bin uh, the size range in bin i is, times the number average of the size range of, in i. So if so, back going back to this slide, uh, the number average from let's say five to ten molecular weight would be seven point five, right? And so that would be what we would plug in to this uh, mi term, and then xi would be whatever the value of that that bin is. Okay, same th thing as you would expect is what we're going to have for the weight average, except now we're going to replace the number fraction with the weight fraction to get the um, weight average molecular weight. And so we just define W there. Uh, if we look at the distribution, so now I'm showing you molecular weight on the x-axis and the amount of the polymer or some fraction. So this uh, gives you the di distribution of molecular weights in a polymer. The number average gives you this peak value. The, the weight average molecular weight gives us this value uh, that's going to be higher than that. Um, and then a third uh, manner in which we can define the uh, molecular weight is called the degree of polymerization, uh, which we just write as DP. And all it is is the average number of repeat units in a chain. So we can compute that just by taking the number average molecular weight, dividing it by M, where M is the repeat unit molecular weight. So that's that's how we define the size of a polymer um, and, and the ways that we can uh, define molecular weight. Okay, let's talk a little bit about polymer shape now. Uh, again, different from, from some of the metals or some of the materials we've looked at and specifically metals, um, the polymer shape can vary because the atoms can rotate freely while, st while still maintaining their bond angle. So uh, this 109 degrees is, is the angle for a carbon-carbon bond. So here we have these carbon-carbon bonds and they sit at 109 degrees. But uh, these cones that you're seeing, uh, are we can spin around that cone and still maintain that 190 degree angle so there's a lot of degrees of freedom in the system and what that means is that as you as you create a polymer chain and let's just assume that it's sort of randomly chooses one one direction uh, in that cone each time you end up having it the molecule looks like it's taking kind of a random walk and the the extent of the molecule the this value r that i'm showing you here in this in this uh, picture it's going to be much smaller dimension than the actual total length of this chain as we wind through here. And that's just because uh, it can adopt a whole variety of configurations. That's important because a tightly coiled polymer won't behave like a stretched out polymer. They're going to, they're going to put, um, if you pull on, let, let's say, for example, you're going to have uh, different um, bonds participating uh, when it's stretched out versus when it's coiled. And then something else to be aware of, probably more as we go into the uh, in next semester when we talk about um, mechanical behavior of polymers. But if we have a polymer like this with really bulky side groups, so I'm not talking about hydrogens, uh, you know, I'm talking about uh, you know benzene rings or something like that that stick off the side of the chain. The, the polymer can't move very easily to untangle or to stretch in response to a stress. So those bulky side groups actually block each other. And that's a phenomena that we call steric hindrance. So th th those are the kind of important features that you need to be aware of with respect to polymer shape. Okay, finally, let's talk about polymer structures. There are four types that you need to be aware of, uh, at least for this class. So the first is um, uh, linear. And all that is is sort of what we've... Uh, drawn in cartoon form thus far, where we just join repeat units end to end in single chains. And so I'm showing you this here. I'm showing you two chains. And the chains are 
going to be bonded together uh, by van der Waals or hydrogen bonds, um, which are obviously weak, whereas the the molecules themselves, the carbon atoms, are bonded together covalently. So uh, inside the molecule, the the bonding is covalent. Between molecules, the bonding is uh, van der Waals or hydrogen. And so they exist sort of in almost like a spaghetti uh, entanglement. Uh, that, that's how they can uh, reside. And some classic examples, these are very familiar ones, hopefully to all of you. Uh, polyethylene, polyvinyl chloride, or PVC. Polystyrene. Uh, PMMA, polymethyl methacrylate, uh, nylon, and then your fluorocarbons are all going to be examples of these linear um, polymers. Okay, a second class or a second polymer structure class is branched polymers. And in this case, it's like uh, the linear polymers, except here now we've added these side branch, small si side branch chains to the main chain. The feature here that is important is that the main chains are still not bonded together by covalent bonds, but they are they do have these sort of um, covalently bonded uh, side branches sticking out of them. And you can imagine that if you have that, they don't pack as tightly, so they're typically are going to be less dense. And so one example that we have of these branch structures is low density polyethylene. Okay. Uh, the next uh, structure type is what we'll call cross-linked. And then in this case now, so here's our linear chains, but now we have covalent bonds that exist uh, between these chains um, via, whoops, via what we call uh, cross-links. Now, um, this is how we get behavior of, let's say, rubber band or rubber materials in general. But think of a rubber band. You pull it far apart, and there there has to be something that pulls it back together into its original configuration. Those crosslinks provide that, uh, that restorative force for that. Um, if we... If, if it's heavily cross-linked, then it's almost, we wouldn't even call them cross-linked chains. We would actually just call them a 3D network of uh, uh, interconnected chains. And they're all going to be bonded together via covalent bonds. So uh, examples of this would be epoxy and polyurethane. And so if you if you use these much, you know, these are typically pretty, uh, real, pretty mechanically uh, strong and stiff. They're very robust. Um, and... And so those are typically all, uh, let's say, like in a network, uh, bonded covalently. So you end up with a relatively strong uh, structure. But in order to form that, you need some a functionality of at least three. Uh, if you only have a functionality of two, you're just going to typically form uh, chain type structures. So those are the, the four classes of structures you need to be aware of uh, as we characterize polymers. Uh, we'll finish the characterization out uh, in the next lecture uh, and then go from there.